Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our talk. Uh, we're going to talk about secrets, uh, secrets detection and prevention. So while many of you have heard about this topic for many years and maybe are a bit bored about it, we're hoping that at the end of this talk, you'll get something new and something that you can go and apply <coughs> in your own organization. And that's why we called, that's why we called our talk From Zero to Hero, uh, roll out your own uh, R-coded secret detection and prevention program with minimum effort, hopefully, that's how we thought about it, and hopefully with maximum impact. Before we dive into the topic, like that? Before we dive into the topic, uh, we had a few questions just to gauge the audience and see a bit who we're talking to. And the first one is, uh, who heard about the Uber hack here in the audience? Uh, raise of hand. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, but who remembers, you know, how that actually happens, right? How the hackers get access uh, to critical systems uh, from Uber? Do you remember a bit how that worked? Uh, that was a while ago, right? But that made the news. That was a pretty high-profile hack. And so how they did that, they got some stolen credentials on the dark web, and they tried to authenticate uh, to Uber, the Uber network with that. Uh, Uber had MFA, uh, and so they were just triggering MFA push notification for the user. And the user wasn't accepting it. And how they did what they did after that, they reached out to the user on WhatsApp and, you know, told the user, we're the security team, we need you to approve those MFA notification. And ultimately, the user, you know, under pressure approved uh, the, the push notification, and that's how they got into the network. Uh, but from there, uh, from there, you know, how did they get access to critical systems? They just had a user access right on the network. While actually looking into the network shares uh, of Uber, they found a PowerShell script, which was, you know, everyone is automating. We're trying to automate ourselves out of our job, so good thing. The only problem is that PowerShell script had uh, the privilege access management system credentials hard-coded into it. And for those of you that don't know privilege access management systems, this is um, a tool that you use to vault uh, you know, pretty sensitive uh, accounts. Make sure your uh, passwords are rotated every time you log into critical systems, so root cloud accounts, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, and you would have kind of um, an additional protection so that the secret is always rotated and, and it can be leaked or reused to then access critical systems. Uh, but so who in the audience think that people in your organization understand that, you know, well, first know about the Uber hack or understand the risk of leaving secrets unprotected uh, and, and potentially end up like Uber? Does many, do you think many of, yeah, in your case? Not many hands raised them. Uh, Unfortunately, that's not, you know, uh, an isolated case. There's many, uh, you know, articles, and like we, we picked up a few headlines. Just recently, the New York Times or Mercedes-Benz had their source code leaked because someone pushed a GitHub token. And there's many other uh, instances uh, of that, and so that's why we think our topic is still relevant today, and, and we think you should care about it and probably do something about it at the end of this time. Um, maybe, well, we've been introduced. Uh, my name is Yasin. I'm a director of product security at Thomson Reuters. Uh, I have the pleasure to talk to you today with... Arber Sandy. Hi there. Uh, I also join like, Yasin team at Thomson Reuters as a product security engineer, and I have been working with him during the past uh, couple of years. And so before we move on to the actual presentation, just a few like remarks on the fact that like what we aim to present to you today is not necessarily like the position of our employer, uh, but more like the knowledge that we accumulated and also like what we will learn about, you know, the, that whole story, that whole thing of secret detection over the past month as we, we have been like working on that. So what we'll do today is, so first, I think, beyond like the, those few examples that Yasin took, I think it's really important to really state why secret detection is still something today. Like, okay, it's not like as fancy as like talking AI-related stuff, but the thing is that it's still a problem that you have, you know, as security engineers or like security-related professional need to take along and take care of. And what we'll also do is that as soon as you're ready like, to develop your own program within your organization, you will face a certain, certain number of challenges. And we really want to go through a few of those challenges because, honestly, like from one program that you just start without you know, visibility and you don't know what is going on, the key point here is really like as soon as you're aware of those challenges, this is how ultimately you will make your, your, your program successful in your organization. 
And so once we have done that, we'll also spend some time to actually present the, that solution that we have been working on on this past couple of months. And that is like an open source project, actually, that we aim to share with the, the community and that you hopefully can use within your organization. So why secret detection? Well, in a nutshell, if, let's take it. The example of GitHub being like one of the most, you know, platform, like STM platform here where developer push code. We might think that, you know, secret detection is something that we know like for decades now. This is something that it's not new at all. And so what people might think is that actually, you know, we should see a decrease of the number of occurrence, the number of incidents and so on. But what we see actually on those reports that deal about this topic is that we have a continuous increase of, you know, those leaked secrets. And if we had like really two numbers that we want you know to share with you and that you should keep in mind, well, the first one is again just the past year. Think about that. Like we had more than 3.5 million secret that got leaked, and just for GitHub and just for public repository actually. So all those unique secrets are opportunity, like you know, for attackers to then get into your system, get into the networks, or compromise you know a library that is used then by your organization and so on and so on. And most importantly, well, when we look at the reports, what we see is that almost half of the breach that organization face is, like, related to leaked secrets. So, of course, like, leaked secret is not just about, you know, hard-coded credential, um, you know, that make it into your repository, but believe us, like, those actually make a good part of it. And so... The thing is that, unfortunately, like leaking a secret is really common and easy, and more actually common and easier than someone might think. And there are actually two big reasons for that. The first one is that, well, a good amount of developers, even today, are not really aware of those risks. Or they might think that, okay, it's easier if I share the secret with my colleagues or across the team, or it's just ease, you know, and speed the development process and so on. And so they are not really aware of the risk of doing that. And as unfortunate as it is, I think it's a reality that it's really important to acknowledge because it's, I want to know that this is how then you can build that program that is really important for your organization. And then the second reason is that, well, sometimes developers know actually about like secret detection, why we should not like hardcore the secret and so on. But the thing is that, and this can happen to any of us, you might like, you know, you're developing your stuff like locally and so on. And so you need, for example, to get access to some system and so on. So you will use those credentials. Oh, hopefully like non-production credential, but not only. And so what might happen is that as, as soon as you push your code, you just forget actually, you know, to, to remove those credentials, and this is how they make it into your, 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 your SCM. And the thing is that once a secret is there, well, removing it is not that simple. And, well, Git, you know, Git is really powerful in helping you managing your source code and so on, but... What that means also is that it keeps track of the history of all your changes. And so it's not just about, you know, removing a secret as, see you, as soon as you see it uh, from your repository, you push and you commit, and that's it. You have to go back to the history, and this is, you know, a hard operation. I think that not many of us, like, know how to do that because it's not something that you expect to do every time as, for example, committing some changes and so on. And... And the thing is that ultimately, like, hard secrets are really a nightmare for organization. Just before I was mentioning, like, you know, you have to clean your stuff in your repository and clean the whole history. But most importantly, as soon as your secret makes it into, you know, your SEM, you have to consider it to be leaked. And so because of that, you have to rotate that secret, actually. And the whole thing about rotation is that this is not as simple as, you know, just creating a new token and that's it. This token may be used, you know, in different systems, for example, and you really have to make sure that when you push that new token, for example, you don't forget that application that is in production because otherwise you face like the risk of having your application down typically. And, and so it's also a loss of productivity actually because those rotation step, cleaning your history and so on, that may take hours actually. And those hours are like hours left uh, in terms of development and, and so on. And of course, like, this is a direct, like, security risk because, and I think, like, the Uber Act that Yasin mentioned is really good at illustrating that. But think about that. As soon as you have, like, your credential leaked, well, it's really easy for an attacker, like, to move both laterally but also vertically across your system within your organization. And 
Finally, well, this is also something that undermines directly like everything that relates to auditing, but also monitoring, which is really important when you do incident detection, but also incident response, basically. So we'll have source code that, that we'll share at the end, but let, let's cover a bit more theoretical ground, and then we'll go into the, the, the solution, I promise. But let's walk through a few challenges of performing sequence detection and also performing it at scale, right? Um, one of the one of the aspects is just the volume of data, right? Like 50 years ago, you could you know ha you had an operating system that was 10,000 lines of code. One of us could probably review it. Uh, I wouldn't understand half of it. Maybe I could find some secrets there. I could do it once, but I couldn't do it every day, or I couldn't do it like in a consistent fashion. And over time, that just became a problem even bigger, right? Today, just your browser is like 25,000 lines of code. So how can you consistently go through that very quickly and make sure you spot all the secrets that you know about and those that are going to be you know, created tomorrow that you don't know about yet? And so you need to be able to iterate and like go through that volume of data very quickly and, and, and very frequently. The other thing that happened is before you had a piece of software, okay, you compile it, you deploy it manually, you copy it, and then, you know, cool, it's running, right? Today, we want to deliver software faster, uh, we want to support new methodologies, we want to bring value to customer fast customers faster. And so while before in one place we had just our source code, and maybe we could have a few secrets, now we have many more opportunities of having secrets in our source code repository. Because we have our integration that's defined there, you know, or testing, that maybe is going to hit some live systems. We have how we deploy our software as well, which may hit some uh, cloud provider, uh, cloud services provider systems, maybe some database services if you use Snowflakes, Databricks, et cetera, et cetera. The possibilities are infinite. Um, finally, you also pull and push uh, artifacts from you know, registries, uh, and, and that's also um, sequence. Those sequences are valuable as well because they would allow potentially to attack your supply chain, et cetera. So there's many new risks, you know, many new secrets. And so one of the first challenges we think just of performing sequence detection, not necessarily at scale, but over time and consistently and like keep up, you know, uh, with, with new secrets is the diversity of secrets. Basically, you have a bunch of secrets. You know, what is a secret? What isn't a secret? A lot of providers have started like establishing patterns, uh, for, you know, for their secrets. That's the case with GitHub. That's the case with AWS. And they publish those so that you can actually, you know, implement a regular expression that would match those secrets. And that's, that's a big deal, actually. Uh, but in many, many other cases, you could do the same for private keys. Uh, I was just taking a few examples here. Uh, <clears throat> and there's many, many others. But then there's all these, you know, secrets that are just like, a blob of data, you don't know if it's a secret, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, some tools look at entropy, does that really solve the problem? And even if that was a secret, you know, against which system uh, should I use this secret? You can't really know. And so that's why we think there's like, the diversity of secret is actually a first challenge, and, and we should look at how, you know, we can actually identify as many secrets that have a pattern that we can identify. Uh, the second piece is various locations. <clears throat> And like this, this, this project that we're going to share with you is meant to be scalable. So it works with small organizations, but will also work with large organizations. And with large organizations, you may have many places where your source code actually lives. Maybe you're on GitHub, maybe you're on GitLab, maybe you're on both, maybe you have a third one, maybe you did an acquisition and they're running a Bitbucket, and you want to support all of them, right? Uh, just to make sure you cover all your ground. But that's not the only challenge we have. So the third one is like how to effectively like keep up with the pace. So today, even if you are, you know, you are a small organization, a medium organization, you may expect, you know, to have hundred, if not like thousand of commits every day and the same amount of pull requests put by your developers. And so all those changes to your code basically is like things that you want to actually scan because those are opportunities where like secret get actually leaked. The fourth challenge is how to make sure that you have a good signal while at the same time, you know, reducing those. What does that mean is that, well, Yasin was talking about, you know, those mechanisms to detect the secrets. So we are more or less like good today on that. But, sorry, thanks. But, so you, you will end up with a set of findings. Does that mean that you have to review all those findings? Well, the response is no, because actually in that you will have a good amount of false uh, positive. And what we mean about false positive here is like all those 
findings that, for example, are not actually a direct threat for your organization. So think, for example, about those dummy placeholders that your developers have pushed, for example, in your documentation because it's important. They might, you know, take a dummy GitHub token that looks like a real one, but actually it's not. Or, for example, it will also be a real secret that in the past, like, you know, had some privilege, but got rotated, but not necessarily removed from your history. And so you will detect it, but it doesn't mean that you have to spend time on that because you know that it will not do anything to your organization. Yeah, and so let's say we are able to identify a lot of different secrets. Cool, we have a lot of regex. We, we, we got those. We can cover all the ground, uh, you know, where everywhere where uh, source code is pushed because we think that's where most secrets can actually, you know, be, be uh, leaked. Uh, we keep up with the pace. Let's say we can see, like, and scan all the changes. We're able to verify that those secrets are valid and just, like, remove a lot of noise. We, what are we doing with all that information, right? We still need to push it and meet the developers where they are. And so that means meet them on their source code management system, GitHub, GitLab, on Jira, if they track work in Jira, et cetera, et cetera, just to make sure that we, don't, we just don't sit on those findings, but we actually act on them and make sure that secrets are rotated and the risk is reduced. And so, of course, like, those are not, like, the only challenge of, like, just to take just quickly one of a few others that are also important. Let's say you have your, you know, your program in place and so on. You are able to find your, your, your secrets into your repositories. Is it enough? Again, the response is no, because if you are just good at finding your secret, but you don't have, you know, a follow-up program, a remediation program in place, and you don't know what to do about that, you are not able to report those, for example, to your management and to your CISO, for example, that will be meaningless. You, you have no strategy about what to do with those findings. And similarly, like we were talking, for example, about false positive, but what about false negative? This is also something that you have to keep in mind because ultimately what may happen is that as good as those you know, tools are, they are not perfect. And so what may happen for various reasons is that some of those secrets that are lying into your source code may not be detected. And so you still have to be aware of that, actually, because it's really important. And finally, like, let's say you have a good program in place and so on, you are good at finding uh, your secrets and you, you build a remediation program. Well, it's also about like those best practices that you, you want to enforce. And again, one reality is that not all organizations are, you know, uh, ha have the same maturity and ready to, to follow up on those best practices. So, here, I'm talking, for example, about the technical aspect of it. So do you, do your organization have, like, those places, actually, where your developer can push, like, you know, those secrets safely, actually? And in the same way, like, what about education? What about your documentation where those developers can refer to, for example? So all of those challenges are really important, again, you know, to take into account when you develop the, the program. And this is actually what we try also to, to, to cover here. So now let's talk about, you know, the presentation of the automated solution that we'll be sharing with you at the end. I promise we'll share the repo at the end. You'll be able to go and, and try it out and, and play with it. Um, but we needed to lay the ground and like explain, you know, what problems are we solving because we may build something that doesn't solve any problem and we want people to really understand what we're trying to solve here. Uh, the first thing is we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, secrets detection has been around for many years. Uh, and a lot of folks are doing it very well. But the thing, that we're proposing today is how do you scale that? Everyone can run a CLI tool, get a bunch of results, but what do you do after that, right? You need the remediation and you need to solve all these other challenges that, that we discussed. And so the first row would be the numbers of detectors. How many patterns are we able to, to kind of like identify? <clears throat> and clearly here, here we see that Truffle Hog is, is, you know, winning the, winning the, the, the race. But okay, we can find many patterns. Can we actually, you know, verify m most of them? And the thing is, a few tools actually do that as well. So they can like identify a secret and then tell you this secret is valid and actually gives me access to a system. And you know, this is something you, you have to remedy. So that's the, the signal versus the noise. <clears throat> then another one, which is interesting is custom detectors such that you can actually find patterns that are, you know, tokens for your organization for services that you know you are using. And so maybe that just, you know, looks like an MD5 hash, but maybe that's actually a secret that is used for a system that you know your company is consuming. And not only detecting those custom patterns, but also verifying, you know, against systems that are not supported yet by the, by the detector. <clears throat> and here that's also something that Trufflehog does. The other aspect is we wanted to have a licensing mode where we could run the tool in internal systems because we also want to make sure, we also, we don't want to want to look at secrets that give access to, you know, 
publicly exposed services, such as AWS or a database service, uh, a SaaS database service, but also internal systems. You know, can we identify the secrets and like and test them on our internal network on assets that are only available internally? Uh, finally, we wanted something that was actively maintained, and so I guess you know which tool we ended up selecting for the scanning piece. Uh, we landed on Trufflehog. They have both a paid and a SaaS uh, and a CLI OSS solution, and we went for the OSS. Because also, if we wanted to extend it, we had access to the code and we could contribute back. Uh, finally, Trufflehog offered many other integrations, so like you know, S3 buckets, syslogs, etc. And we thought, well, that could be something that we could extend, uh, you know, even more in the future. Uh, there's other, you know, good scanning solutions like GitHub Secret Scanning. But if you wanted GitHub Secret Scanning, you need to buy the whole GitHub Advanced Security. Maybe if you have that, you can already benefit from a lot of, you know, the the what the solution provides today, but if you already have another SaaS and SCA solution, well, you may not want to buy just GitHub Advanced Security just for that. Uh, and GitGuardian is also doing a good job, and they provide like ISC. Uh, Trufflehog also had a paid solution. If that's really something that you're interested in, uh, you, you could have a look at it. Uh, but now that we have a tool, well, we're done, right? Uh, we can go home and run the tool manually and just go parse through that JSON output and, and open tickets manually. No. We wanted to offer a reference implementation, like something that is extensible and modular as well. So that, yeah, thanks. And modular as well, so that if you want to pick just a few pieces, you can pick just those few pieces. You don't need to consume the whole thing. If you already have something that covers some aspect, you don't need to you know, redeploy. We also wanted something that is extensible, um, so that if someone wants to bring support for another SEM, or you know, do processing in a different way, they can do that. And for that, we went with you know Terraform, which is uh, an infrastructure as code language that is you know famous and many people use it, and Python, which, to be honest, in AppSec seems to be the language of choice for most. Um, so that we wanted to invite for contributions, and, and that's why we made those choices. So. What you will find, like typically in that solution, is like two two main parts. The first one is what we refer as backend and utilities. So for the backend, it's like all those configuration that you need to set up, and that's the actually like the solution will set up for you, and that will aim like you know to support those scan that you want to do, and so that will be the first step you know to get started. And then what you will also have is like what we call you know processor and also ingestion. So ingestion are like all those processing scripts you know about the findings, but also other metadata. Actually, and this ingestion will give you like that persistent layer where you will then be able, like you know, to build like those dashboard and and, and so on. And as for the processors, uh, look at those as like opportunities, you know, to enrich actually those rule findings that you have with other metadata. For example, metadata relating to the repositories actually that you are scanning, because then you can again make more informed decision on that, and not just about the finding actually. And so for the main component, what you will have is like first what we call like the, we refer as the schedule scan. And here the goal is really, you know, to, to keep track on compliance, make sure that all the time, you know, your teams are like making the right things, meaning that as soon as you detect the secrets, they are actually rotating them and how fast actually they are doing that such that then you can compute, you know, MTTR and things like that. And most importantly, uh, we have like those ongoing scan so that actually we can keep up with the pace. And so the idea here is really to, to be able to make those scan happening as soon as you have changes that is, uh, that are sorry, happening into your repositories. So as for the architecture like diagram that here we are presenting to you, of course, like those are like simplified because here the goal is not, you know, to delve into the details right now, but obviously we have like all the specification and documentation, like should you want to know more like about those other internal resources that support those kind of initiative, but most importantly, we wanted like to, you know, to depict like how, what, what's the flow actually for those two type of scan. So, what happens first, like when you will take the scheduled scale, like scan piece, the uh, schedule, uh, you know, um, the, the detection mode here, what you will have to do is like first and simply like define what scan actually you want to run. And for that, actually what we, we try to do is like to provide as much as like configuration option as you want, such that you can easily like um, meet your needs. For example, maybe you need to, you know, scan a big organization that you have on GitHub, but then aside you have some few teams that are using as and so on, uh, Azure DevOps, and so this requires like a different approach because you know that the size is smaller and so on. 
as soon as you have like those uh, scan defined, well, you will deploy actually through Terraform that like the whole infrastructure. And so by doing that, what will happen is that all those configuration will get ready, you know, in a bucket ready to be used as you will have like those scan trigger automatically. And so for those scan, actually, what will happen is that you will define, you know, just the schedule you are interested in to have, for example, every week or whatsoever, depending on your need. And so you will have that, you know, an event that will trigger the workflow. And the idea is that you set up, you know, as many EC2 instances in the case of AWS in that case, but so as many instances, um, you know, backend server as you need to perform the scan. And so why so? Well, mainly just so that one scan is not polluting uh, another. And again, to go back to what I just said, you may then, you know, uh, meet your needs. So, for example, you may deploy a, a big instance if you know that this typical scan will take a lot of resources and time, while for like smaller scan, you can just have a smaller instance and so reduce also the cost and control everything here. And so, last but not least, like all those findings will get reported to that bucket, ready like to be actually ingested. So, okay, we produced result, results, now we need to ingest them. Maybe one note is, you'll see that we talk about AWS and we'll talk about GitHub. But again, we try to make things as generic and extensible as possible so that you could bring your own cloud, ideally, and that's not probably the right expression for that, but you could extend it to support your cloud provider, and that's how we thought about it. And so one thing that we did for the ingestion piece is uh, we have you know, AWS step function, something very light, but one of the first thing we wanted to look at is, okay, today we're using RDS uh, with PostgreSQL as a, as a backend, right, for the, for the persistence uh, layer, and then be able to go and run queries. First of all, we decided to go for, uh, you know, SQL database, because we assumed most people would be able to, you know, work with that and, and create their own reports. <clears throat> but the thing that we wanted also to support is extensibility, and for that we chose, I mean, one of our colleagues chose to go with Alembic, which is a Python library that allows you to do migrations, and so as we extend the schema over time, we have a safe way to do migrations and probably as well rollback, rollbacks, right? <clears throat> so that's the first technical choice that we made there. The second one, as we work in Python, so Alamic is in Python, we went with SQL Alchemy that many of you maybe already know, and for the same reasons, right? We start with a PostgreSQL today and an RDS database, but maybe you want to use SQLite, maybe you want to use Snowflake, maybe you want to use something else, I don't know. If SQL Alchemy supports it, you'll be able to do it. Uh, we tested thoroughly with uh, PostgreSQL and SQLite, uh, but you know, we don't expect any problem given how SQL Alchemy is tested and, and you know, publicly used. Okay, now we decided on our back end, we decided how to manage our schema and extend it over time. Um, how do we do ingestion? And for ingestion, we have a step function and we're gonna use lambdas. I mean, we, we are using lambdas and you'll be able to use that. And you can either trigger it on a scheduled fashion, you can have it triggered by an event as well, or you can manually trigger it to do your ingestion. So you could do some of those steps manually or when you see that your schedule scan is complete, go and say, I want to ingest the data now, and then you'll have all the data in your database. And what will you have in your database? I think that's a good question, right? Today we support you know, scale scans and ongoing scans, so you'll be able to see, okay, I ran a scan this day, maybe I had many other jobs, many jobs because I'm scanning 10 different SCMs or like, you know, that many repositories, and you'll be able to see the status of all those jobs, whether they failed or not, and whether findings, you know, secrets were found, verified secrets here we're focusing on, were found during those jobs. And you'll be able to actually query and see the findings themselves and understand what they are and you know, what you should do about it. Uh, another piece is also uh, the ongoing scan. Those also feed to like, the scans and the jobs. So as activity is happening and ongoing scans are triggered, you'll see those uh, you know, populating the database as soon as you trigger the ingestion. Uh, now let's talk about the ongoing scans, which are the cool part of the time. So, indeed, like, schedule scan and so on, like, are really good, you know, again, to keep track uh, on what is going on, but if you remember about those challenges that we are mentioning, I think that one of the most important one is, again, being able to react as fast as possible and also meet developers, like, where they are. And so that's why we, from the beginning, wanted, like, you know, to follow up with those uh, schedule scan with something that will be more, like, automated and more continuous, actually, and so such that you, you have, like, those uh, challenges uh, covered. And so... 
Again, like essentially here, we are focusing on GitHub just because it's one of the most like used platform, but like the approach and so on could be easily extendable and some of the piece actually of the logic here uh, will be like easily, uh, could be easily taken, you know, and, and implemented and that's actually what we, we aim to do in the, in the near future. But so let's look at what happens here concretely. So for the ongoing P3, you will have to deploy a GitHub app, so which is really fast and simple and we will tell you like, which kind of you know, configuration you need here so you can get up started really fast. And the idea is that as soon as you have your GitHub app, well, you will continuously react to those events. And those events, in that case, that we are interested in is all those updates you know, to your source code, right? Like those commits and those pull requests and so on. So as soon as we detect those events, actually, the GitHub app will be, which is actually just, you know, a webhook, like you just transfer the information uh, to a backend server for processing. So the GitHub app will fetch those events, and so what it will do is, like, just, you know, forward those events to an AWS function that will act actually as a backend server that will, like, do the first uh, iteration of processing. And so what we mean by that is that, uh, we will first, of course, like check that the event that we receive are from GitHub, like from your own organization, just for security purpose, of course. But beyond that, we'll just you know filter those events because we are not necessarily interested in all what is happening. And for example, in your case, just like you know an opinionated decision here, but that you can change easily is that we consider that the most event that we are interested in are like for example the push that are made into the default branch, assuming that most of the case like default branch refer to the production branch, and also all those events that are happening in a pull request, like a pull request being opened or modified because you, you push new commits on that. And so the idea is that to, to perform the scan, and so where actually where you have your repository, so within GitHub directly, and I also in terms of cost perspective, I think like we did some like like check and that will be like the, the best approach here. But so Anyway, the idea is really like to perform the scan again using Truffle log in, in the same way and so on. And we also like again offer some configuration like option just to make sure that you can be more in the control of what is happening and what you want actually like, you know, to, to, to scan. Like, do you want only verified secret or all the secret? Because for whatever reason, even like unverified secret are important to you and you know that you will not anyway have a lot of them. So you can keep up and, and check on them just as a few examples. And so as soon as you have findings, or even if you don't have findings actually, we will push those results back into the bucket because again, the idea is also to keep track on what is going on. Uh, do you have the scan and at which uh, like frequency and so on. Uh, and so we will push those results that will, like Yassin said, be able to be ingested with the ingestion module that we have. But actually most importantly is like what follow-up action you can do. And so here in, in, particular, uh, in particular what we do is that so for pull requests, for example, we will automatically, you know, push a, you know, a request for comments about listing all those findings. Actually, we will also type the pull request such that developers may directly, like, be, you know, uh, notified and then can they can sort of react to like those um, th those leaked secrets. And similarly, like for the issue, uh, the push story to the default branch, we will open an issue and, you know, assign it to the developer responsible for the leak secret and so on so that they can, again, get notified and, like, remove that as fast as possible. And, of course, like, the idea is also to point to that documentation and get them help, like, you know, and get started to, to, to do that work, actually. And this is something that you can, uh, you know, uh, tailor to, to your need if you have, for example, internal documentation and best practices. The last piece is that, okay, maybe some of you, like, within your organization, you have, like, public repositories because you contribute to, you know, you have your own uh, open source, for example, um, um, framework and so on that you share with the community. And so you may have those public repositories. And so, of course, like, we, we thought about that. And the idea is that if you were pushing those issues, typically, well, something that might have not get noticed, you know, in the beginning will have just gained even more attraction. And... Actually, this is really important because even if you don't believe that, we, we, we have seen like in the past, like breaches where in very few minutes actually, as soon as a secret gets leaked, you know, in a repository, what happened is that in very few minutes you have those 
continuously like process that scan all those public repositories and react to them and I'll have the whole automation in place to, you know, to, to do, for example, a full clone of your repositories and, and so on. So that's why for public repositories, what we do typically is that we offer the option to just make the repository private, private sorry, first before like commenting and so on, so that you can first take action and then go back like to the, to the normal case. Okay, so now you're going to be able to look cool in front of your developers and your AppSec friends at the AppSec dinner parties, right, um, with that ongoing scan. <clears throat> but basically, what, what have we looked at? We've looked at how can you go from just running a single CLI to actually, you know, r rolling out a program, uh, go where developers are, react and prevent, you know, secrets from actually being leaked, uh, enforce best practices and, and, you know, encourage actually best practices, but also get a baseline of, you know, how is your organization looking like today? And potentially also look cool in front of your CISO with those, you know, cool SQL queries and like show them that, you know, actually you're, you're making a change and you're improving the situation in your organization. <clears throat> and so how to get started? Well, I promised you you'd have a repo. So if you want to scan the QR code, go ahead. I won't judge you for that. I do the same at all the security conferences. Uh, and basically, how would you get started? You would clone the repo, I mean, fork it, uh, because as we said, for the ongoing scan, the, the, the workflows are running in your, in your GitHub organization, you know, um, actually building GitHub minutes. Uh, but most of the, most of the, of the project should be cost effective. Uh, so you wouldn't have any bad surprise. Uh, your finance folks are not gonna, you know, come uh, chasing you, telling you what's that AWS bill, right? Or that GitHub build, for that matter. Uh, but so you could just like fork it, uh, update the document, update some some parameters, and go and roll out, roll it out and deploy it. We are looking for uh, you know contributions. We're also looking for feedback. So once you deploy it, we, we did our best to do good documentation. Now we may miss, we have missed something. We also did our best to harden uh, that solution. Now if you have suggestion to improve it, please feel free to open a pull request. We'll review it and try to merge it uh, as, as quick as possible. Now one disclaimer uh, before you go and start you know rolling. Uh, disclaimer about verification. There is a risk around verification. So if I can push, you know, um, if I can push untrusted input to your, which will be the case depending on how you deploy it, to your secrets verifier, you may actually be hitting live systems with passwords that are not good for users that are real and potentially end up in locking act, locking accounts, potentially being recognized as someone who is actually generating malicious traffic. If you go out through the same egress point as some production system, potentially you can impact your business, so be careful about that and make sure you understand, you know, what you're scanning uh, and, and, you know, what you're testing against. Um, we have some next priorities and maybe some of you here uh, can, you know, help us, you know, reach, reach them. On the reporting side, if you're a SQL wizard, Power BI wizard, an op some open source, you know, BI tool wizard, please let us know. Uh, happy to have you help us, you know, build those dashboards. We have a few queries. This is not something that's new. We have some ideas on what we should, you know, what we will implement for that solution. But if you, if you want to do it, please let us know. Uh, there's another piece, which is rotation. Uh, there's a few things about issue creation. We have some scripts around that. Uh, we're just working on the ingestion piece. Uh, but if you have ideas to support new systems, uh, please let us know. We have an SCM inventory piece as well, uh, increments of scan support new cloud platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so please, you know, go on the repo. Uh, if we don't support your, your system and you want to help us support it, uh, happy to, to get your help there. Uh, but before we wrap up, we wanted to do a big thank uh, to our e heroes who helped us actually helped us get from zero to a successful program. Um, <clears throat> One of them is Shubham Hibare, our colleague in, in Bangalore. We did most of the ingestion part, so thanks to him. But also thanks to everyone else who actually helped us refine that reasoning and understand, okay, what are the risks and the challenges that we actually need to, you know, tackle? And also, I mean, that would have been bad if we didn't thank them, but the folks from Travel Security, right, just for making that tool open source um, and helping, you know, us fix bugs or just reviewing our pull requests and merging them uh, to help us improve their, their tool as well. Um, and with that, thank you, and we'll open it for questions. Well, first of all, many thanks, Yasin Araba, for this amazing presentation. And then we have five minutes remaining. If you get some questions, you get the mic just here. Hi. 
Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the tool. Thank you for making it open source. That's really, really cool. Uh, I was just wondering, have you thought about putting this closer to the developers, like running the scans on, on the endpoints, on, on the machines of the developers, so that they don't actually commit the, the secret? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, do, we have pre-commit, and we do scan, you know, we know about pre-commit, actually, if you don't know about pre-commit, we invite you to look at it. I think pre-commit may be challenging to deploy on endpoints, uh, because you need to have a way of pushing that, you need, you need to install it in each Git repository, do a pre-commit install, et cetera, et cetera, so we thought that wasn't scalable, and if we ask folks to do it manually, I mean, it's ideal, because the, so the, the secret never makes it out of the workstation, uh, but Technically, it could, it could be challenging. So that's why we went on the prevention side. But ideally, the, the further left you shift, and the, the earlier you detect secret and prevent them from making to their history, the better. Um, if you have ideas on how to do that at scale for like, you know, some standards, uh, management, device management systems, happy to get your help. But that's, that's the, the kind of the decision we made. And Trufflehawk supports it. Like, if you go to their documentation, they tell you we support pre-commit. So, you know, they're already doing it. Uh, we're not going to pretend this is something new we bring. Uh, we, we try and cover, like, things on the, on the right side of that. Cool. And the, another one, uh, what about metrics? I mean, which metrics are, like, the key ones that you are saving so that you share these amazing reports with your CISO? Yeah, so um, that would be potentially what you could report on is, like, the number of repos that you've scanned, you know, uh, the number of events that you have intercepted, so how many pushes to the main branch you've, you've actually covered and scanned, or many, how many updates in a pull request you've scanned, and then commented, uh, you know, the pull request to help the developer understand, hey, you're actually going to push a secret, or issues you've created, how many of those have been uh, remediated, those are things you could uh, do today. Um, and then just the number and the type of secrets, you know, what type of secrets do I have? Do I have many AWS keys, Azure keys? Uh, maybe you have, there's one that's like Teams uh, webhook, which allows you to send a message on the Teams channel. That may not be the, the, the most critical one, and you could probably filter those out. Uh, but you can report on all those things today. And maybe like two, two other metrics will be like, actually, again, like how much time does it take, like, you know, to, to a team to rotate the secrets? And most importantly, like the repeated offender, what we, we can call like, like that. So who is like, which team or which developer, you know, is pushing like again and again, like as for phishing, like who is making the mistake, uh, as, even if like they are in front of like that, those best practices and so on. And the goal is not, you know, to do a name and shame, even if that could be actually also a good strategy, but it's also like how to then tailor your education program on that actually, like how to, to, to focus on those specific teams that need, for example, because they, are, they don't have the maturity of your other teams, for example, and how to, to build that education program such that over time, hopefully, like, you see a decrease of those occurrences for those teams. So that could be also two other things that you may want to track typically. Thank you. Okay, maybe one last question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation and for the tool. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, first one, whether you have... Uh, like a mechanism to handle false positives. So let's say you have a false positive and I have a look at it. I want to just mark it as false positive, put that in the database and then like not do any of it, like the remediation stuff uh, for it. So just marking uh, non, uh, like false negative stuff. And the other question is about how flexible the auto remediation feature it looks very interesting. But obviously like it depends on many factors, like what type of secrets sometimes you want to uh, like just delete it from the repo. Sometimes you just want to rotate it, maybe keep the old one. That's not a problem. Sometimes you want like some human eyes to have a look at it. So how, how flexible is it to configure the remediation steps? Okay, so probably um, on the first one, on the false positives, like this is a problem that we rely on Trufflehawk to solve mm -hmm. with the verification piece. So for example, if they find a you know access key and what looks like an AWS access key and secret key, they would go call, you know, do a SCS get caller identity on AWS. And if the answer is positive, they know that you know, this pair actually um, is valid. And they do that for many others. And so for that piece, we rely on them. And we, like by default, the solution will only report on things that have been verified. Because <laughs> if you look, sometimes when you do a scan, you would have, I don't know, just like 10%, 10% that are actually verified, and you have 90% that are like not verified. And we made the conscious decision of like not going and bothering developers with that yeah, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at it, but you could still ingest that data and only uh, work, you know, react on verify. We don't do actually auto remediation. We do uh, rep repository visibility change, which okay. means if you have a repo that's public and a secret gets pushed there, 
we offer you the possibility to immediately make it private, just to make sure the secret doesn't get exposed too long. Um, but the, remediating automatically is an interesting feature, but I think there's like secrets management solutions that do all that rotation, you know, and, and yeah. I don't know if we will be able to actually uh, solve this. Actually, like, as, sound, like, as good story as it sounds, the risk is that, like, again, you face the risk of, like, if you do the rotation, you have to keep track of where, for example, the token has, has been used and so on. And so here the risk, let's say, is too great, like, to, to take it, let's, let's say. And so I think that sometimes you also need to be humble, and typically this is a, a limitation, and you have to acknowledge that. So we try to do as, as best as we can, for example, with those few things, but in the end, it's really about like the developers making, because they know actually what they need to rotate and so on, and this is why we were saying that, you know, as part of the challenge is that even if you are good at finding your secret and so on, if you don't have those, you know, program, then the remediation program in place, if you are not able to communicate with the team, make sure that the teams make that a priority, for example, they allocate resource, you know, to, to, to those kind of issues, then it will not work. Because, you know, the technical, like the tools are good, but we also have to keep in mind that they, they cannot do everything and it's key, like, to, you know, the education and communication with the rest of the team and so, and so on and so on. Makes sense. Okay. I, I may have one last question Just about like the. May, maybe you can continue because its okay. time is over. Okay. And everybody wants uh, are hungry, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's <laughs> discuss. Okay. For those that are interested, let's discuss. Like we'll yeah, be around for the rest of the conference. Okay. Thanks um, again. Thanks again for your talk. Thanks everyone. Bon appetit. <laughs> <laughs>